Hey everybody, thanks for joining me here for this lesson. In this video, we're gonna be talking about the foundations of group behavior. So we define a group as two or more individuals who are interacting and inter interdependent and have come together to achieve particular objectives. And what we mean by that is that these people have to work together in some, in some way, how they succeed, is dependent upon one another and that they're working towards the same goals all right so within our organizations we can have either formal groups or informal groups and formal groups are defined by the organization structure so for example as a professor i am in a specific academic department and my colleagues and i we work to put together a cohesive academic structure and curriculum for our students Okay, so even though we don't always, we don't teach in the same classes, we work together to coordinate our classes so that they provide the curriculum that our students need. Okay, then we have informal groups, and these are, these are kind of structures that aren't formal, and they're not determined by the organization. So what you may have in terms of an informal group is you may have a few people who would like to see something happen within the organization, and they work together to make that happen. Maybe it's a group of people who decide they want to put an event together or they want to change an organizational policy on something and they come together informally to work on making this happen. Related to groups, social identity theory considers when and why we people consider themselves as part of a group and how we react to the success and failure of those groups. So often we think of social identity theory within the context of culture, but people belong to many different groups that they identify with over the course of their lives. So they may have cultural groups that they identify with, but they also can identify with their organization. They may identify with their industry and so on and so forth. So for example, I remember years ago um, when there was a, a strike in a community that I lived in, our local teachers union had gone on strike. Teachers from other areas were standing behind these teachers because they felt like they were all part of the same group. So even though they didn't have a vested interest in that particular strike, they found themselves identifying with the, with the profession and providing support because they felt as if the challenges that their, their peers in another district were experiencing were reflective of them as a whole. Okay, so again, social identity theory deals with how we are connected to groups and how we respond to the success and failure of those groups in general. Now, we also have something in our, in our organizations called in-groups and out-groups, and these are obviously not formal um, in the sense that they're defined by the company, but th this is something that emerges kind of informally. And in-group favoritism occurs when people see members of their own group as better than other groups, and people in other groups are considered the out-group. All right, so to give you an example of this, years ago, uh, there were a few people from a company that I worked for that were recruited to a competitor, okay? And we, we went over and the company that we were recruited to had about 200 employees in the office we worked in. There were probably about 50 or 60 employees. And there were probably about five of us who had been recruited over. Well, the rest of the employees in the office had been at the company for a while and they kind of, they kind of represented the in-group. Okay. They were the original employees. They were part of the, the main team and the five of us who had been recruited over from the competitor, we were considered the out group, okay? They, they viewed us as not understanding the company's culture, not understanding the way that the company worked. And it took a long time for us to, to actually be accepted into the culture at our new employer because we were recognized as an out group. Now, these in-groups and out groups that we just talked about, they kind of paved the way for social identity threat, which is very similar to what we talked about in previous units with stereotype threat. And what happens with social identity threat essentially is that people think they're gonna be evaluated more negatively because they're associated with the out group, okay? And this may, may create some uncertainty for them. Uh, this, this concern about being evaluated negatively 
because they're a member of the out group can cause people to lose confidence and they can actually in, influence their ability to perform in the workplace. Consequently, while being a member of an out group is likely not related to your performance at all, the negative impacts associated with social identity threat can have a negative impact on somebody's performance. Because of this, managers should really do everything they can to reduce or even eliminate the presence of in-groups and out-groups in the workplace. Because these, these in-groups and out-groups can create performance issues when the actual differences between people shouldn't lead to any performance differences at all. Now, as we move forward to talk about what happens when groups perform activities, let's talk about temporary groups for a moment here. And one model that helps to explain how temporary groups perform is the punctuated equilibrium model. All right, and what the punctuated equilibrium model basically says, it says when temporary groups get together, they have their first meeting and they have some introductions and maybe come up with a plan and stuff like that. But after that first meeting, things are kind of slow. Okay, time passes, but they don't actually do all that much. Okay, then at the halfway point, there's this, oh my gosh, we have to do this work moment, right? So there's like kind of a transition here where all of a sudden productivity ramps up a little bit. But then again, we fall into kind of this, this sense of inertia here. All right, so we have kind of our, our moment of urgency, but then a little more inertia. And then as we get to the end, there is a, a big jump in the group. It, markedly accelerates performance to get the job done. And as you think about the punctuated equilibrium model, I would encourage you to think about group projects that you've participated in in school, right? Because very often we see that same thing happen where you might have a month or two months to work on a group project. And in the very beginning, you kind of aren't doing all that much. Then all of a sudden you get, oh my gosh, the project's coming up have your little lull, and then the night or two before it's done, everybody puts in a lot of work. That's an example of the punctuated equilibrium model. A role refers to the type of behavior that we expect from someone in a certain position within a group or within a social structure or organization. Okay, now what's challenging with roles is that roles are defined by perceptions and expectations all right and perceptions and expectations are not always consistent so for role perceptions all right this is how a person themselves envisions the way that they should behave okay so as a student you may have a perception of what your responsibility is okay i once had a, a student tell me that they didn't think that they needed to do any work outside of class that it was that it was their job to go to class and be engaged, and it was my job to make sure that they that they learned everything that they needed to in class. Okay, their perception that it was my job to make sure that they learned everything they needed to in their class session was their role expectation for me as an educator. My role expectation for them as a student, however, was that they were gonna study and do their work out of class and be prepared. So essentially they had a perception that they didn't need to do anything outside of class. I had an expectation that they did need to do things outside of class. So there was a little bit of a conflict between the perception and expectations. And what happens when there's a, a conflict between role, one's role perception and others' role expectations is that we tend to have a violation of what we call the psychological contract. Okay, so the psychological contract is based upon our role expectations for others. So essentially, um, in this case, the psychological contract I would have with the student is that I would expect them to invest in their education, you know, as laid out by the expectations of the course. Okay, but because their role perception was not consistent with that, there was a disconnect and uh, the psychological contract was not upheld. Now, related to role perceptions and role expectations, we have something called role conflict. Okay, and role conflict is a situation where an individual faces divergent role expectations or the expectations of them in their role are kind of in conflict with each other. All right, so to give you an example here, um, 
I have a, a great passion for the sport of distance running. And I was a cross country runner when I was younger. And, and years ago, I was actually a cross country coach for, for an NCAA team. And as a coach, my athletes had an expectation for me that I was going to be doing what was best for my athletes at all times, that I was going to be doing things to help them develop, to make them better athletes, to make them better people and so on. Okay. Uh, the college also had an expectation that I would recruit athletes. Okay. And that I would do everything that I, that I could to bring new athletes to our campus, new students to our campus. All right. And under normal conditions, there would be no issues with, with these two sets of expectations. But our college at the time was dealing with some accreditation issues in one of its programs. So for any students who were remotely interested in that program, you know, I didn't really feel like it was in their best interest to come to our college because how would you like to come to a college to, to be a nursing student and then have the nursing program lose accreditation only two years into your college career? That would be a terrible experience to have. So. You know, I felt like the expectation of me recruiting all student athletes that I had the ability to recruit and the expectation that I would do the best thing that I could for my for my students, for my athletes were in conflict in that situation. OK, now that that role conflict that we're talking about there, that deals with with conflict that comes up from expectations within the same role. We can also have something called interrol conflict, and this is when our expectations for for different groups or for different roles are in conflict with each other. Okay, and a great example of this, and I know I talk about work family conflict a lot, but work family conflict is a great example of interrol conflict. Okay, because often people have expectations in their jobs that they're going to put in extended hours or a lot of work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and these these expectations can be in conflict with the expectations for their roles as parents, their roles as, as spouses. All right. So when those two things come in conflict, that's an example of interrole conflict. So we've talked about our role perceptions and our role expectations. Well, the real question here, right, is how do these role perceptions and role expectations influence our behavior in groups? Well, you might be surprised at the answer to that question. All right. And um, some of the insight that we have on this comes from Philip Zimbardo's prison experiment, often referred to as the Stanford prison experiments. And what Zimbardo did in these prison experiments was he assigned students to two different roles. Students were either assigned the role of prisoner or they were assigned the role of guard. And he created a, a simulated prison in the basement of a building on his campus. Okay, and students were assigned to participate in whatever their given role was. And Zimbardo observed the behavior. Well, I'll tell you what happened with this experiment they actually had to cut this experiment short because people took to their roles so quickly and so genuinely and, and to such an extreme that it was actually a damaging experiment for the participants. And, and many people dealt with emotional repercussions of participating in this experiment all because they assimilated to their expected roles so quickly and so easily. Now, related to our roles within our groups, we have norms, okay? And you've probably heard of norms before. They're basically just the acceptable standards of behavior within your group that are shared by people who are members of the group, all right? So it's, it's basically how we expect all people to behave in a situation. So in the example here, we're showing the norm is to go down this the set of stairs that we're looking at here, but we've got one person here who is violating the norm and going up the stairs. Now, group norms are really important in our organizations because they have a, a strong influence on our behavior, okay? So, for example, norms can influence how we conform to different things, okay? They can, they can lead to us potentially conforming to ideas that are not correct, all right? And this was illustrated in the experiments of Solomon Ash. And what Ash did was Ash had some group exercises. People were in groups of seven to eight people. All right, and they got cards just like the ones you see on the on the screen here. Okay, they got cards just like these. They were asked to participate in matching exercises. 
All right. And in the first two rounds of the matching exercises, everybody in the groups just basically gave correct answers. But in the third round, there was a twist. Okay. What people didn't know was that each group of eight people had a few people who were members of the research team in the group. All right. So in round three, when it came to, to matching as the group went through their discussions, the first member of the research team would say something like, I think the length of line X matches the length of line C. Okay, now if you look at these two things, they are clearly different different length lines, right? But that's what the first person would put out. Then the, the second group member, who's also a member of the research team, would say, yeah, I agree. I think X and C are the same length. All right, and then what happened is there's six people left, and people are under pressure of do they follow the norm and agree that X and C are equal, or do they stand up against it? And what Ash found was that 75% of participants at, at some point in time during this exercise followed group norms and gave incorrect answers. Norms and groups can influence our emotions, and this really shouldn't be too much of a surprise here. You know, as, as we often see, emotions have some type of contagion to them. But essentially what we'll see here is in our groups when a few people get excited about something, more people get excited about it. When a few people get upset about something, more people get upset about it. Okay, and this is really important to understand because, you know, if we're looking to change some of the emotional reactions in our groups, or if we don't want to influence them in a negative way, we have to think about, you know, what type of emotional labor do we need to experience as individuals in order to influence our groups the way we want to influence them. Now, some of the things we've talked about with norms might not sound all that great, but norms can also have a positive impact on group, group outcomes. Okay, so when we think about um, ideas like corporate social responsibility, you know, initiatives to do positive things in the community. Okay, as these become normalized in our organization, as they become norms, more and more people jump on board with doing these things. Okay, in general, positive group norms can lead to positive outcomes, but there do have to be certain factors present. Okay, and one of those factors is do people actually care about the norms? And what some research has found is that if people are satisfied in their jobs, they care about, about conforming to norms more than if they're not satisfied. But just as positive group norms can have a contagious effect on people's behavior, so can negative group norms. And one of the ways that we see this play out is through something called deviant workplace behavior. Okay, and what, what deviant workplace behavior deals with is basically voluntary behavior that violates organizational norms, violates expectations, has a negative impact on the organization. So there's a, a list here with some examples. It shows like leaving early, intentionally working slowly, sabotage, lying about hours worked, and so on and so forth. Um, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a, kind of an example of where I've seen this in the workplace. So one company that, that I worked for had um, had some incentive bonuses for employees. And there were ways that employees could could kind of game the system on on getting these incentive bonuses. And that kind of became a norm within within the company was that people would do little things that would help them get get bonuses when they were close but couldn't quite get there. And that almost became like an accepted behavior. Now it was something that I personally didn't do for ethical reasons, but you know, when I resisted doing it, I actually had a lot of pushback that I had to go against because I was the one who was violating the norm because the norm was to engage in this negative workplace behavior. Now, often within our groups, we find that different people have different levels of status. And what we mean by that is status is kind of their the position or rank that we give people with within our groups. So often there is kind of like a, a top ranked leader type person and then and then status kind of cascades down from there. Okay. And according to status characteristics theory, uh, status can come from one of three different sources. The first is just just the power that a person has. So in this image here, I've got Joffrey Baratheon or King Joffrey Baratheon from Game of Thrones. Um, 
King Joffrey had power based upon based upon his birthright in that organization. That's an example of, of power, right? Um, then we have a person's ability to contribute to a group's goals. So if we were to to step back real quick and we were to look at um, a phenomenal athlete like LeBron James or Tom Brady, okay, these people continually have have status when they go on onto new teams because they have the ability to contribute to the group's goals. Both of these players have moved from one team to another, have won championships with teams, and then moved from those teams to other teams and helped those teams win championships. And everybody knows this. So when they when they join new groups, they tend to have status based upon their ability to contribute. Okay. And then people can also get status based upon just individual personal characteristics. So they may be very charismatic. They may be very likable. Okay. And if, if people like them, then their status tends to be a little bit higher than if people don't like them. Now status can influence how people behave within our, within our group. So when we think about status and norms, people with high status, can kind of deviate from norms more. So if you're in an office where people dress more conservatively, somebody with high status may be more likely to come in in jeans and sneakers than somebody with, with low status, okay? Um, in terms of group interactions, people with high status can speak more and be more assertive because there's, there's less risk associated with them doing that than for somebody who's of low status to, to be assertive, okay? Uh, sometimes there can be perceptions of inequity in terms of status. All right, now generally speaking, there there tends to be kind of a consensus on status, but when there's not, and people perceive that status was achieved inequitably, there can be kind of some disharmony and, and conflict that results from that. And then people go through steps to, to kind of correct what the status dynamic looks like. All right, there's also a... Uh, relationship between status and stigmatization and what we mean by this is there's some research that shows that the status of one individual may be influenced by the status of those who they associate with so if you associate with multiple high status people in your group people may start to begin to think of you as being high status because of your association with others who are who are high status and then the the final component is that that status can be related to the whole idea of in-groups and out-groups that we talked before. Often, you know, kind of because of this stigmatization and this these relationships that we talked about, uh, we'll see people in an in-group be, be afforded higher status than people in an out-group. Now, that is not right. I'm not advocating that that is right, but that is the dynamic that we see um, emerge in the workplace. And then what happens because of this is we start to have some polarization between groups that results from these status differences. Now, as we think about forming our groups, we wanna think about the size of the group overall. So large groups are really good for gaining diverse input. So if we're doing stuff with idea generation, having a large number of people can be very helpful. But when we actually have to produce something um, smaller groups can be better for that. And by smaller, we mean like seven or fewer people. And part of the reason that smaller groups can be, can be better when we have to produce things is because of this idea of social loafing or the tendency of, for people to kind of do less when they're working with other people uh, than they would do if they were working on their own. So groups can be really great if everybody's putting in good effort. But if the task that we have doesn't require as many people as we have involved in it, then there's naturally going to be some people who step back and do less work. And that type of social loafing can be frustrating and lead to conflicts within the group. Now, for all the things that we've talked about with groups here, there are definitely some, some benefits and there are definitely some weaknesses to group decision-making. And when we think about the benefits or the strengths, okay, we, when we make decisions in groups, we tend to make decisions based upon more complete information and knowledge because different people come from different backgrounds and they bring different, different types of information with them. Related to that, we also have increased diversity of views. So when we think about the perspectives associated with our decisions, We've increased the diversity of perspectives. And because 
multiple members of the group obviously have input into our decisions, there could be some increased acceptance to the solutions. It's not a solution that was handed to you by somebody else, but it's a solution that you actually had the opportunity to contribute to. Okay, but when we think about the weaknesses of group decision making, it can be very time consuming. Okay, because we do have to flush out all of the different information that we have within our groups. There can be some conformity pressures like we talked about before. And sometimes some of our members, particularly those with high status, can dominate discussions, okay, because they might be a little more assertive in discussions. And also responsibilities can be ambiguous, right? Because we have to determine what our responsibilities are within the group. And sometimes people struggle to to identify what roles are gonna be and to, to assign roles to other people. Um, but people might not always step up and take roles. So there can be some ambiguity there in terms of what role each member plays. So how do we evaluate our group decision-making? Well, here's a few places in terms of effectiveness and efficiency that we can start. So we can look at the accuracy of decisions made by groups. Generally speaking, groups tend to be more accurate than individuals because of all the information and perspectives that they bring to the discussion, okay? They can be less accurate than the most accurate member of the group, but generally speaking, they tend to be more accurate than, than individuals. All right, groups tend to take a little bit more time than individuals do to make decisions, all right? And that's because we have to talk through all the different perspectives, all right? And because of that, you know, groups may be less efficient in sometimes because of the amount of time that they take to make decisions. In terms of create creativity, there is very little debate on this. Uh, groups are generally considered to be more creative than individuals. And the results, the decisions made by groups are also considered to be accepted at a higher rate than decisions made by individuals. Now, building off what we talked about before with conformity, groups often engage in a process called groupthink. And this is a situation where pressures for conformity kind of keep people from expressing their, their views or unpopular views, maybe don't get expressed. And I've got a picture of the, uh, the Challenger disaster up here on the, on the screen. And what this is, this is a space shuttle that, that actually um, exploded due to an issue with, with O-rings in the space shuttle and it's a well-documented case that's often used in organizational behavior to explain group think because what happened here were there were some concerns about whether or not the temperatures outside were right for launching the space shuttle uh, there were concerns that the o-rings had never been tested in the temperatures they were experiencing and there were some recommendations that the that the launch be delayed but those recommendations were unpopular and people in high status positions argued against those recommendations and put a lot of pressure on the engineers to change their position. Ultimately, everyone who had shared concerns ended up conforming with what those who, who were of higher status wanted to take place, and the shuttle launch was not delayed. Uh, the shuttle launch, however, was a disaster as the shuttle exploded and everybody on board lost their lives. So this is a, a very... Uh, well-known case of group think and it is a very extreme case in terms of looking at the outcomes but it illustrates how badly group think can can impact us within our groups and how tragic the implications of that can be all right now group shift um this is a situation is a little bit different from group think where what we see in in group shift is that a an individual decision maker may actually kind of change where where their position is and move further away from the group so we have a little more polarization all right and part of uh, what can lead to group shift is that as people talk through ideas they become a little bit more comfortable as they become comfortable if they're on opposite sides of an idea they, they kind of move away from each other So how do groups go about making decisions? One way is through an interacting group. And this is basically where we come together for a meeting to discuss what the decisions that we have to talk about. All right, people meet face-to-face -face or in, in today's day and age, this may be a Zoom meeting or, or something that is uh, facil facilitated through technology. 
All right. And what happens with interacting groups is that people often will censor themselves and there might there might be pressure for for people to conform. So in the, the group think example that we just talked about, uh, that was an example of something that happened in an interacting group. All right. So that's one of the one of the challenges that we deal with here is that when we're sitting in a meeting with a group of people, it's a lot harder to stand up and express a diverging point of view than it is through some of the other methods that we use for group decision making. One way that we can try to deal with some of the challenges created in interactive groups in terms of censoring ideas is to engage in brainstorming sessions. And in brainstorming sessions, a group leader will state a problem and then ask members of the group to express any ideas that they could possibly think of. So the, the, the point here in brainstorming is not to come up with the best ideas we tell people, but we just wanna come up with as many ideas as we can. And one of the key rules in brainstorming is that no criticism can be allowed, okay? Uh, what this does is as people throw out different types of ideas, one idea will maybe inspire a different idea and we'll come up with a, a broad range of alternatives. And until we're done with the brainstorming activity, we don't actually evaluate any of the ideas. Now, the nominal group technique is a little bit of a variation on brainstorming, okay? So we bring our, our groups together, much like we do in interacting groups and brainstorming, but they actually go through some idea generation separately. Okay, so it's almost like an independent brainstorming where we then regroup. Okay, and what, what this does is this allows people to put all of their ideas out there without, without fear of criticism. Um, and often what we find with nominal groups is that they do outperform brainstorming groups. So on the next slide here, we're going to take a look at the steps to the nominal group technique. Now, the nominal group technique starts with putting a problem out there and asking each member of the group to write down all their ideas about the problem, okay? Then after each member does their independent piece, we go around and collect ideas. And how we do this is we do kind of a round robin where we'll go in a circle through each member and each member gets to present one of their ideas to the group. We ask each member to present their best idea, okay, their top idea. Now, if somebody has already presented your idea, you move on to your next top idea, and so on. And in some cases, uh, groups will do this just going through once. In other cases, you can go through two or three times or until all ideas are out on the board, however you want to do it. Then once all the ideas have been collected and have been put up in order, uh, the ideas are discussed for clarity. So people ask questions just to clarify what's meant by different ideas. All right, then we ask people in the group to rank ideas. All right, and then we go through the rankings Rankings can be turned in anonymously. They can anonymously rank the ideas, but we'll tally up the, the rankings and figure out which idea has the highest ranking, the highest aggregate ranking, and uh, meaning is overall ranked to be the best idea. And that will determine the final decision. So for example, we might ask members to rank their 10, what they think are the 10 best ideas with the best idea getting 10 points, the next best idea getting nine points, and so on and so forth. And then the idea that has the most total points from all members would be the final decision. Now, as we wrap up here, you can see that each of the group decision-making techniques has some, has some differences here in terms of their effectiveness. So the nominal group technique tends to generate the uh, highest number and best quality of ideas. Interacting with groups tends to have the most social pressure involved in it. All the ideas are pretty, all the techniques are pretty inexpensive. All right, they all seem to have relatively moderate speed. All right, uh, the brainstorming and the nominal group technique are a little higher on task orientation than interacting is. And then you'll also notice that uh, the potential for personal conflict, commitment to the solution, and development of group, group adhesiveness are all high with interacting groups, all right? The development of cohesiveness is also pretty pretty high with brainstorming groups as well. All right, so that wraps up our discussion here today on the foundations of group behavior. Hope you enjoyed it, hope you learned something, and we'll talk to you soon.